Um, the Evening Grow Speak Working Group is what we're spotlighting today. And it is, um, this is a in very interesting bird and a very uh, dynamic uh, working group. Quite different, a different stage from the previous two uh, webinars that we had featuring the least turn and the lesser yellow legs. Our graduate fellow, Quinn Carvey, will introduce today's program in more detail and of course the presenters. Quinn? Yeah, thanks, Paul. So thank you everyone for coming to today's webinar. Uh, it's my pleasure to introduce today's speakers who will be giving a talk about one of our pilot species, the Evening Gross Speak. Our first speaker is David Yaney, who is the avian ecologist for the Pennsylvania Natural Heritage Program at the Western Pennsylvania Conservancy that's based in Pittsburgh. David has 17 years of professional experience in ornithology and bird conservation. He has a master's degree in applied ecology and conservation biology from Frostburg State University and a bachelor's degree in biology from Masai University. His work focuses on bird species of greatest conservation need, including rare and endangered species. David's projects include bird monitoring and surveys, applied habitat relationship studies, spatial analysis in GIS, and bird tracking research with new technologies. David represents the Pennsylvania Natural Heritage Program in several bird conservation groups uh, and committees, including the Pennsylvania Biological Survey Ornithological Technical Committee. He co-leads the Evening Gross Speak Working Group, which formed as part of the Road to Recovery Pilot Species Project. Our second speaker is Matthew Young, who has been observing and enjoying nature since a very young age. He has lived in central New York for over 26 years, and during this time, he's studied everything from birds to orchids to bogs and fens. Matt received his bachelor's degree in water resources with a minor in meteorology from SUNY Anita and his master's degree in ornithology from the SUNY College of Environmental Science and Forestry. Matt did his master's research on avian diversity in restored wetlands of central New York at the Great Swamp Conservancy. He was a regional editor of the Kingbird for 10 years was an adjunct professor in environmental studies at SUNY Cortland, and currently teaches an intro to birding class for Cornell University. He was the collections manager, management leader and audio engineer at the Macaulay Library at Cornell Lab of Ornithology for 12 years, has published several papers about finches, and is currently working on finches of the United States and Canada with William Stokes. Matt is the president of the board and founder of the Finch Research Network. So thank you so much, both David and Matt, and I'll turn it over to you for your presentation. Thanks, Quinn. Hey. Yeah, thank you, Quinn. Um, so we're just excited to be here today to talk about um, our project, Even Grow Speak, initiating continental research and conservation for a steeply declining eruptive migrant. So before we dive in, we want to take a few moments to highlight three levels of um, organizations, groups, and people that are really making this conservation work for Evening Grow Speak possible. First, we want to thank all of our financial supporters shown here on the screen, and we're just so appreciative of all your contributions to this work. And a special um, mention for the Knobloch Family Foundation. Uh, we just want to make the statement that this project really would not be possible without all your support. Uh, next, we want to highlight the primary collaborators in this R2R pilot species project. Um, you, you'll, you'll see there's a lot of uh, people and groups involved, but this is kind of what we define as the core uh, collaborator team. Um, so we have the Carnegie Museum of Natural History uh, and, their, and their Powder Mill Avian Research Center, including Luke DeGroat and Mallory Sarver. Of course, the Finch Research Network with Matt Young, who is a co-lead of the working group with me, as well as um, Matt Sarver from the Finch Research Network. And then my organization, um, the Western Pennsylvania Conservancy and our Pennsylvania Natural Heritage Program. And finally, here's our growing list of, of really awesome partners and groups, um, individuals who are working on specific conservation objectives or who have joined the working group at large and might be looking to further collaborate. I'll just let this sit here for a moment so you can, can get a, a look at just all the, the, the members that we are um, having in the group now. And I just wanted to um, kind of make a statement that, that as we get started, Matt and I are gonna go back and forth throughout the talk in kind of a tag team effort. 
And we just really hope you enjoy this presentation and we look forward to an engaging discussion afterward. So uh, Matt, let's go ahead and dive in. Sounds good. So a lot of people might not know that, I mean, we're trying to look at obviously populations and how they interact with one another. And we're in the early stages of this, you know, and we've been mainly just focusing on type three with our banding and tagging effort. But a lot of people don't know that there's five different subspecies or call types of evening grosbeaks that follow a paper that was published by Tom Hahn and, and a couple of his students in the early 2000s. And so, you know, we're mainly focused on type three, but type one and three are the eruptive ones. The other ones tend to be pretty resonant, it seems. Uh, there's not a lot known with type five, but we're really eager to get out west to do some research on particularly type one and a couple of the other intermountain uh, call type subspecies. Next. And so what, you know, what drives, you know, it's just a dynamic species. Um, a lot going on with it. it you know, it, it feeds in some areas of the country. Some of these subspecies seem to feed more on pine seeds. Uh, other parts of the country, you know, they feed on maple, you know, Samara seeds. Uh, but it's clearly, we know that spruce budworm plays a pretty big role in the dynamic for this bird. And when it cycles, populations seem to respond, both in you know, I want to say both in the montane forest of the west and to in the boreal forest to the north. Next. Okay, so uh, in 2016, Partners in Flight actually featured the evening growth speak on the cover of its land bird conservation plan. And it was cited as having more than a 90% continental population decline since 1970. So for what was once a regular winter finch across the Midwest and eastern parts of its range, and an abundant montane forest bird in the West, um, almost silently, every nine out of 10 gross beaks has disappeared. And we're all well acquainted now probably with the, the Rosenberg et al. paper that came out three years later, showing 3 billion birds lost and a 30% population dec decline across all North American birds. Um, now uh, we can we can look at eBird trends maps, and you can see the one on on the the left here um, that shows extensive declines in red across the evening growth speak breeding range, especially throughout the southern boreal forest, the Pacific Northwest, and the Sierra Nevada. Here in Pennsylvania, where I am, we can also see this decline in winter banding data from Powder Mill Avian Research Center dating back to 1960. So on the right here, a couple figures showing that they would go from a high of capturing over 4,000 gross beaks and banding them in the 1970s with regular cyclical pulses in population numbers down to just a handful of birds uh, banded at the site since 2000. So with this, with this uh, such steep decline really in evening gross beak, um, it's been added to a number of bird conservation lists. And that was starting with Partners in Flight and their watch list in 2016. But also in the same year, the Committee on the Status of Endangered Wildlife in Canada, COSAWIC, did the most comprehensive conservation review uh, to date, focused on the ca Canadian only population and resulted in listing it as a national species of special concern. Evening Grow Speak was added to the IUCN Red List as, a, as vulnerable in 2018. The Fish and Wildlife service birds of conservation concern at the continental level in 21, and of course, as a uh, road to recovery tipping point species last year. Um, also here in the US, some states will be reviewing evening growth speak as uh, species of grace conservation need for their 2025 wildlife action plan updates. But it's clear from this graphic, which is from the Bring the Birds Back campaign, um, that evening growth speak is a bit of a poster child for bird population loss in the boreal forest. And the species also inhabits the montane forest out west, as Matt mentioned. So it begs the question, is evening growth speak an indicator of boreal and montane forest health? Matt? Yeah, so I mean, getting to this question in, in the title of this slide, I mean, I think I, I would certainly argue that it, it is in a lot of ways. And there's a lot of unique opportunities with this species because 
you know, it's, it's charismatic. It's, it's eruptive. You know, we put out the winter Finch forecast every year and it creates a lot of interest. I mean, it's, it's amazing when I do, when we put out the winter Finch forecast, the Finch research network, you know, the numbers and the number of hits on the website just go through the roof when evening growth peak is in the news. And so, you know, when you look at the life cycle of this particular species, you know, it, it, there's some u- unique opportunities in that it comes, it often comes to our backyards some years. It graces our backyards. And there's a lot of interest in this bird, just evidenced by the interest in the numbers here today. Um, we all have that story of, you know, talking to people that when I was a kid, you know, this bird, you know, we would see it by the dozens or even hundreds in our backyards everywhere. But then they'll continue and say, I haven't seen it for decades or many years at this point. Um, it's clearly a bird that cycles with budworm to some degree. And so as budworm goes up, we see these birds just kind of like, uh, you know, I would say there's a high, pretty high correlation, although looking into it would would confirm it a little bit more, but a high correlation with the spruce budworm warblers, which we all also tend to love, but they don't come to our backyard feeders and don't necessarily also come to like, you know, backyard bird watchers necessarily. I mean, there's a lot of unique partners and people that are interested in this from loggers to, you know, backyard birders, to more diehard birders, to foresters, to scientists, to even the bird, you know, feeding industry has a lot of interest in this. Do bird eruptions, do forest, do eruptions of evening grow speak, even drive seed sales to some degree. Um, and so with that, I would argue that, you know, this bird, you know, is kind of serves as an indicator of boreal forest health and health of, of boreal birds in a lot of ways. And it's an umbrella species for a lot of these other species that, you know, we have a lot of interest in. Uh, from, you know, Tennessee warbler and Cape May warbler, and I should add purple finch as well. And so when the numbers tend to go up, you know, we get them more in our backyards. There's a lot of buzz, a lot of interest. There's a lot of educational and conservation opportunities that we can, you know, take advantage of. We can increase, you know, education around how do we interact with them and, and, and really care for them. The more we're interested in a bird, the more we often care Sometimes I wonder, do you know, do we make this a poster child for wellness for finches, wellness for you kind of campaign? Because, you know, the more we kind of interest have interest in these birds, the more we're going to care about them. And it serves as an umbrella species for these other ones we care. And there's collision interest. You know, there's uh, unfortunately, you know, when they come to our backyard in numbers, we have to then start to also address issues around disease and uh, collisions as well. So there's an, you know, an educational opportunity there. Uh, next. Okay, so in the fall of 21, uh, 2021, we became one of four road to recovery species pilot projects. And our charge was to number one, establish a working group focused on evening growth speak continental conservation. And number two, to study the evening growth speak throughout its full annual cycle across its continental range. You've seen now that it spans the entire continent from east to west. And this was really to be an expansion of the the movement research that the Western Pennsylvania Conservancy and the Carnegie Museum of Natural History had been doing with Pennsylvania winter populations since 2017. Um, And so this was with a primary goal of trying to identify limiting factors in the gross beaks decline. And finally, we are following as best as we can, uh, the road to recovery four phase process, um, integrating both biological science and social science in a co-production framework, uh, essentially trying to be intentional about the inclusion of human dimensions and all parties with a vested interest in evening gross beak conservation. And I'd say, I'll point you to the or to our website. There's guidance documents there and a lot more information on this process. Uh, currently, we are squarely in phase one, where we are working on assessing what the problems are, what the limiting factors are, and learning um, about those and filling in those knowledge gaps. So, setting the stage for our pilot species project work. We started by looking at the existing knowledge base for evening gross beak. And we went especially back to the, the COSAWIC uh, status assessment for Canada 
to see what possible factors might be causing this steep and somewhat mysterious decline. What were the leading thoughts and possible knowledge gaps? Now, some of these threats are facing many birds and even other taxa, but in particular, uh, we pulled out that, as Matt's already mentioned, evening grosbeak populations are strongly tied to spruce budworm population cycles, and such that too much or too little management of this native forest pest could impact both the prey abundance during the breeding season as well as habitat quality. Now, evening grosbeak might be suffering from habitat change and loss of mature conifer forests where they breed. Um, evening grosbeaks are also known to suffer from road collisions when gritting for minerals during the winter, but also, as Matt alluded to, um, and just makes sense, as they visit our backyards, um, they're, they're facing a greater risk of window collisions as, as well. Evening grosbeaks, too, in our backyards are gregarious in winter. They gather in these large numbers and they're susceptible to rapid disease spread like conjunctivitis seen here. And finally, a warming climate really threatens the persistence of spruce fir forests and western conifer forests where evening grosbeaks peaks are found. Matt? Yeah, so, you know, we formed this working group now two years ago. Um, you know, we've been focusing on, you know, he, David's been more focusing on the banding and and the uh, tagging part of the process or this project. But, you know, I've been really trying, we've given a ton of presentations at this point, like 25 or 30 different presentations about this uh, particular project. This was actually a photo. I, I did a coffee house uh, chat at Saxon Bog with some of the major kind of players and the people that were most interested in that area. Um, Saxon Bob, Bog tends to be, you know, one of the most popular places for a lot of people to go to see these boreal birds that we don't see every year. Um, I also gave a presentation, a wider presentation on finches and also this project to standing room in their new visitor center there. Next. So as I, I just alluded to, we now have given a lot of different presentations across 12 different states, uh, 25 different uh, groups. You know, we continue to put, to put out information on social media via Facebook or Instagram or LinkedIn. Um, we also started uh, a feeder cam in Maine that is uh, that's you know was helped funded by Aspen Song Wild Bird uh, Seed. Uh, you know, and it's you know just another way we can kind of bring interest to people because you know I do believe in a lot of ways this species is an indicator of of boreal and montane forest health. And, you know, this is actually from this morning, right, David? Yesterday morning. Y yesterday, yesterday morning. morning. Yeah. You know, yeah. we got a holiday festive uh, little scene there. But, uh, you know, last year there were hundreds of gross peaks at this site. This year there's a couple dozen. Um, mm -hmm. But, yeah, it's exciting to just get – there's such a buzz around this bird. That's Sometimes it's contagious, certainly for us. Next. Right, so we currently have more than 60 working group members from across the US and Canada. And uh, we just seem to be adding more, more members, the more of these programs we do, the more meetings we go to and present. So it's, it's been really great uh, to see the group growing. We are still building representation in the group because we're trying to really reach all corners of the species continental range and the diverse interested parties in, in its conservation. So. So this is the plug. Let us know if you'd like to contribute. Um, you know, you can talk to us after the, the presentation concludes and we have discussion and you can also shoot us, um, you know, messages um, in email or otherwise. But, but right now we have a working group structure that's focused on assessing, learning and filling the knowledge gaps across five priority areas. So we've got these priority teams that, um, that are focused on, on diet, direct mortalities, which includes collisions, cats, and disease, migratory connectivity and population dynamics, habitat, and climate change. And today, we're really going to focus on the work that we've, we've done to date in these three priority areas, diet, direct mortalities, and migratory connectivity. Matt? So yeah, so from a diet perspective, we have, you know, I've kind of have these connections and this relationship through uh, this project and the Finch Research Network 
Uh, we're working with students at Oregon State University to look at, you know, what are they eating across the range so that we're looking at, you know, photographs in eBird and iNaturalist to try to get a handle on that. We started our own iNaturalist gross beak finch foraging project, you know, and there's a study actually that's been funded by the uh, Wild Bird Feeding Institute as well because of such interest in the backyards. You know, they come to our, our, our feeders in such numbers some year, some years that it really kind of drives that industry. You know, there can be shortages when you have these eruptions of finches in certain areas of the country. And gross beaks, you know, are, are, are widely known. I mean, it's one of the nicknames for them uh, was grocery beaks. Um, so there's, a, you know, there's a lot of interest from a, a lot of different kinds of partners um, and it's, you know, it just offers a lot of different opportunities, I believe. Uh, next. Right. So um, next is the direct mortalities group, which which really does encompass, uh, you know, with three different kind of topics, areas of, of threats. Um, this team is being driven by the work of Stephanie Egger from the USGS and Joel Gearing at the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. And so by, by now it's well known that glass collisions are a major factor in, in bird mortalities with over a billion birds dying estimated in the US each year alone. So evening grosbeak has actually been the most commonly reported glass collision species for the bird banding lab since the 1960s. Some of you might not realize that, but it, it kind of was eye-opening to us as well. And, and uh, finches are among the, the top species um, reported um, overall to uh, to the bird banding lab. So um, earlier this year, uh, the Fish and Wildlife Service uh, wrote, wrote an article on a tagged evening grow speak from our project that we tagged in Maine that was reported as a collision mortality along the shore of Lake Huron. And I'd encourage you to go visit that, um, that story, uh, Don't Let the Sun Set on Evening Grow Speaks. The BBL is also seeking funds to further um, analyze their, their collision data, and especially looking at links to feeders and, and backyards. Um, Fish and Wildlife Service and USGS are also working with the Wild Bird Feeding Institute and the Finch Research Network on an educational marketing plan for bird food buyers and sellers to really reduce collisions. And then we've just recently um, had uh, a member from uh, University of Arkansas join our working group to begin examining disease factors. This is this is kind of a more unknown for evening growth speak. There's not a lot in the literature, but we know that they they are impacted by the the mycoplasma conjunctivitis. And one of the birds you see here is is one of our birds from our site in Maine. And while we were up there sampling, we found it to be about 26% of the birds we caught that year um, to have this disease. So. It's, it's possible this is uh, a bigger factor than we might realize. So uh, Matt and I are gonna uh, tag team this slide, but I'll just start with um, mentioning that we have several projects that are looking at population dynamics and migratory connectivity. And some of these are student led, which Matt will describe in a moment. But the primary R2R research project is really our continental connectivity study, which was began by WPC and CMNH in Pennsylvania seven years ago. And I'll discuss the details of that and our progress and the slides that follow. But in case you don't know, we're essentially applying approaches, approaches like those described in Cohen et al, shown here with this graphic, uh, linking locations used by individuals or populations across seasons, measuring the strength of co-occurrence to help understand the effects of threats and limiting factors that can impact populations. Matt, you want to tell us about the student projects? Yeah, so, you know, we have some students at Oregon State University and UC Davis. We're working with Doug Robinson and also Tom, Tom Hahn. And so we have some students looking at, you know, as I described earlier, there's these different populations, you know, and mainly we've been tagging and banding these birds in the east. But we have work going on right now out west looking at diet, looking at range boundaries, looking at how some of these populations are interacting because we know type one wanders throughout the West and comes in contact with pretty much all of these different cold type subspecies. Um, so we have students there at Oregon State and UC Davis, Cornell, 
uh, has also helped us with, uh, you know, supplying some ARU units. So we have ARU units out in the Southern Cascades to look at that contact zone between type one and type two. We also had a student at Jackson Hole this year looking at the contact zone between type one and type four. And they looked also into diet and was looking at spruce budworm outbreaks in those areas because this is not just a boreal bird, but it's a Montane West uh, species as well. And we also have, uh, there was a long-term study. Well, it's not a long-term study, but there was a statistician in the 60s that gave an estimate on the number, the magnitude of number of evening gross beaks that visited Oregon State University. And so Doug Robinson has picked that study up with some of his students to start to look at it. And he wrote, a, he, you know, he published a paper that showed the magnitude of decline compared today with the number of birds that actually stop over in their northern migration. This would largely be type one that stop over at Oregon State University, pick that up just to kind of compare numbers then to numbers now. So there's a lot going on out west. And we really would love to get out west to do some some tagging and banding. And we know this year is a good year for these populations to be interacting. Some years they don't interact as much. Some years type ones don't really erupt as much, but we already have good evidence that type ones are well into the Rockies and they're at feeder stations, kind of you know visiting the same feeder stations that the Rockies subspecies or type four also is visiting. Uh, next. Right, so now I'm gonna cover some of the results we've had, the work we've done to date on this continental um, migratory connectivity um, aspect of, the, of our research. So with this research, we wanna try to identify limiting factors and fill in the knowledge gaps at the continental scale. So, so we're looking to link populations across the annual cycle of the evening gross beak, and we're doing this by targeting the capture and tagging of, of wintering birds and then following them to their breeding areas and throughout their migration. Uh, we'll be looking to map the evening gross beak local and landscape scale use of habitats because we're using some some very new new technology that can be applied to a bird this small um, with low tech sunbird satellite tags as well as um, the modus radio uh, nano tags that we've been using for for several years uh, and we want to do this within five major regions of the u.s winter range because that's where we feel we can capture them most easily uh, at this point and apply our methods. So we're looking at the upper north, what, northeast, the lower northeast, the midwest, the interior west, and the northwest. And to date, we've, we've um, been able to get samples from three of those, the upper northeast, the lower northeast, and the midwest. But uh, ultimately, this is a really a long-term project that WPC, FERN, and CMNH uh, will be, <coughs> excuse me, continuing to, to work toward um, you know, get, getting that migratory connectivity um, quantified and help us better understand what some of these limiting factors might be. And to do that, we really feel we need to get 50 to 100 of these annual cycle linkages across the continent and also recognizing that this is an eruptive migrant and not your typical neotropical or long distance migrant. So there are going to be some uh, maybe idiosyncrasies or other factors we have to consider whenever we look at its connectivity. So I just wanted to provide this table to, to summarize uh, the work that we've done to date, dating back to 2017. And this is from a tagging and banding summary uh, perspective. So we've, we've um, been color banding all birds that we've captured to allow re-sightings after <clears throat> birds have been released. And this is a good way to, to get uh, community scientists involved, backyard bird watchers, involved and we've had actually 93 resightings of our color banded birds to date. <clears throat> um, in total, we've, we've color banded almost 400 birds, uh, radio tagged 160. And then over the past two years, thanks to us expanding this as an R2R pilot species project, we put out satellite transmitters on 46 birds. And this is across Pennsylvania, Maine, Minnesota, and New York. So to, to date, we've gotten uh, six, about 16 satellite tracks that give us high resolution. The MODIS tracks are, are lower resolution, but we have 41 potential tracks, mostly from Pennsylvania though, we'll say. So we need to get that distribution across the range. And I'll, you'll see some, some maps here in a few moments that will, will show you what those tracks are looking like. 
But before we look at those, I want to give some pictorial highlights of what this work looks like. So um, in Pennsylvania, as I said, we started this work in 2017 and um, have been able to put out the, the radio nanotags until um, for, for the years prior to the R2R project being initiated. Um, we are, are using uh, targeted capture with bow nets. And we uh, have added this, this nice little uh, ice, ice fishing hut that we're able to use as a blind and to, de to deploy the traps and do all our tagging and, and banding and processing in. Um, Minnesota was actually the first site we went to to deploy the, the first ever low-tech Sunbird satellite transmitters on evening gross peaks. And we work heavily with our partners at the Friends of Saxim Bog there, uh, Sparky Stensis pictured with Luke DeGroat and I there, and a uh, special shout out to the, the Olalas and the Driscolls for uh, inviting us into their backyards. And um, yeah, so here's the first two birds ever that wore these satellite transmitters. We also have been to Maine, where we deployed, I, I think it was 11 of these satellite transmitters and 30 or more of the nanotags where there's ex, uh, existing MODIS network. And um, that was in Northern Maine in Aroostook County. And um, huge thanks to the, the partners that um, Matt Young was able to set us up with there to, to capture those birds in their backyards. And uh, finally, New York is, is, a, is the other area that we've been able to sample from, both Southern New York and um, the Adirondacks, uh, Central Adirondacks. And um, we are hoping to get back up to New York because we, we need a bigger sample there. We didn't tag so many birds there with the satellite transmitters as we were focused on uh, Minnesota and Pennsylvania last winter. But a uh, photo that Matt and I always like to point out is this one with the, the icicles hanging down on the, the ice shelter there. That was a day where it was minus 30 degrees wind chill and um, we were able to operate just fine. And I think we ca caught about 16 or 17 gross beaks that day. So now what, what are we learning or what are we, what are we seeing um, you know, from these tracks, from the, from the transmitters we're putting on these birds and following them throughout their annual cycle? Uh, I'll give a highlight of some of the, the best data we have of MODIS, and then we'll take a look at the satellite uh, data from the low-tech sunbird tags. So to date, um, we've, or as of, sorry, I should say, as of September of, of this past year, we had MODIS detections for 105 evening gross beaks away from the tagging site. And we estimate there could be potential linkage tracks for 41 um, birds from Pennsylvania, Maine, and New York. And it's worth noting that these are a bit um, uh, lower resolution, larger scale, larger errors around the um, stations that birds are detected at, but still very useful data that we plan to integrate with our migratory connectivity analysis. And uh, and then here's here's the map that uh, that is is something that has never been shown before <laughs> um, in one of our presentations. This represents our uh, 16 evening gross peak sunbird tracks from March of 22 through December, uh, through essentially yesterday uh, of this year. And you can see tracks connecting birds from, from Minnesota, Pennsylvania, Maine, and New York to areas in, in Canada, ranging from um, Manitoba to, <laughs> to New Brunswick. And I'm not gonna to get too much into the, the meanings of this, but we really wanna show that, that you know, there are some interesting things happening with birds in Minnesota going to vastly different locations. And a lot of our birds from Pennsylvania going to uh, a similar area or nearby area in, um, in Southern Quebec. And a lot of the main birds kind of sticking close to home. And we'll take a look at one of those birds in just a minute, but uh, we'll be beginning to, uh, hopefully build up the sample size across the major geographies we mentioned to really understand the migratory connectivity, hopefully identify limiting factors, but we're also going to begin spatial analysis of habitat and landscape use in the near term for the birds that, that we have here. And we'll be um, partnering with St. Lawrence University and Sue Wilson and her students there to get us going on that. So all totaled um, as of December 5th, uh, we had 46 tags go out on evening gross peaks that have 
collected over 13,000 total positions and over 6,000 of those are ones that we would very quickly be able to say are high accuracy, uh, more accurate than the, than the MODIS detections uh, from about one and a half kilometers down to sometimes less than 250 meters. And as I said, we've got about 16 of those high quality tracks to date. So as we conclude here, I, uh, Matt and I just wanted to highlight one of our really special <laughs> birds in this project that we've nicknamed Champ. Um, this is an evening growth speak that we tagged in Maine in April of 2022. And this bird is still transmitting at 20 months later with over 2,700 total positions and over 1,200 high accuracy positions. So um, I'm gonna let this video play and it's gonna be uh, about a, in condensing 20 minutes or 20 months, sorry, of his uh, his life into uh, 60 seconds. So you see moving around nearby the tagging site in, in um, Maine in June of last year, going up into the Gaspé Peninsula, spending his time there throughout the summer and then working back down in early fall into Northern Maine where he, remained really until October. And then November, he began what we think is a hunt for feeding stations to where he finally settled into this Mont Magny area along the St. Lawrence. And he was there for, for many months um, until mid-May when you're gonna see, he decides to shoot up north, but then come right back south. So that's an interesting part that, that we weren't expecting. And then he goes back up to Gaspé where he spends the summer and then again in late August comes back down to northern Maine and uh, is a little bit further north of the tagging site but then in the beginning of November Champ moves back down and is within about 20 kilometers of the site where we tagged him in 2022. These birds are amazing. Um, so that's that's where we're going to conclude and then hopefully begin the discussion. And uh, for more information on this work and the road to recovery, you can see our pilot species page listed there at the link. And then also you can check out Matt and I's organizational web pages there and uh, reach out to us directly through email if you have uh, more questions or comments. With that, Quinn. Yeah, thank you so much, both of you, for a really interesting talk. It's so cool to hear an update on the Evening Grow Speak and all of the amazing work that you've been doing since you formed this group pretty recently. Yeah, <laughs> yeah so we will now open it up to the question and discussion period. So feel free to both raise your hand or join via audio or to post your questions in the chat. Like there was a question in the chat I thought I saw, right? Yes, we have a question from Ron who asked, what are the risks of direct mortality from vegetation management, such as timber harvest, thinning, or prescribed burning in nesting habitat during the nesting season? You want to take that one? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's, I mean, that's, that's always, that's kind of like the, always the big question, right? Whenever there's uh, habitat change, habitat loss, um, it's really tough to get at those, those numbers um so that's that's why we're kind of focusing where we are um on the migratory connectivity aspect but certainly we're going to be able to look at where these birds go where they're different individuals and then kind of summing that into a population if you will um and and then we'll be able to look at spatially uh, what sort of forest management or other forest factors habitat landscape factors um might be going on in those regions and and then linking that to the birds and the populations that are that are using those areas for breeding. Matt, you want to add anything to that? Yeah, I, I can add. So you know, the interesting thing is, you know, this bird, you know, it's a spruce budworm bird. So in some ways, at least. And you know, when you ask the question about forest thinning and logging and burn, you know, prescribed burns or even natural wildfires, you know, we also are losing acreage from budworm outbreaks to some degree. Um, you know, there is some management that goes on there, but it's very interesting to think of all of these as potentially adding up to a certain amount of, you know, loss habitat. I mean, they, you know, the budworm, you know, there's been an ongoing budworm outbreak, 
uh, apart, apart, uh, across large areas of Ontario and Quebec into um, New Brunswick. There's a really large one also in Labrador now that's been ongoing. I mean, the, the uh, Quebec one has been ongoing for about 10 years now. So, you know, as those budworm outbreaks, you know, kind of intensify, you do lose habitat. You know, it almost serves as a, you know, an incubator of a lot of, you know, high reproductive success for a period of time. But then, you know, if the budworm is persistent in that area, those trees are also, they die. So it's, you know, it's a very interesting dynamic, uh, you know, assessing or even contemplating, you know, how does fires and logging and thinning and, you know, and, and die off just from die off from um, budworm outbreaks, how yeah. that might impact it. Yeah, I mean, that's why we, we do have a habitat priority team, which we just haven't um, had a lot happening in just yet. But as we are collecting and, and you know, kind of processing some of these tracking data, we're going to be able to look at specific habitat use um, and working with the habitat team to to look into that. I think I saw a question in the chat uh, specifically uh, looking at effects of vegetation management on nest mortality uh, during the breeding season versus waiting for these practices until after the nesting season. Yeah, it's, it's a great point. Um, we would love to get breeding season work going. And, you know, that's one reason we want to continue to add partners to the working group and particularly those in Canada where, you know, it's a large swath of the evening growth speak type three breeding range. What's next, Quinn? Yeah, so we have a question from Casey who asked uh, whether you thought that perhaps some of the more northerly declines could be uh, because of southerly range shifts. Um, rather than ne necessarily actual population declines. It seems like they have kind of a perception of a local increase where they are in Colorado based on eBird. Could you, could you rephrase? Re yeah. <laughs> yeah. There's a, a lot to digest there a little bit. Sorry, <laughs> yes. Could That's some of the bad. northerly declines of these populations actually be um, just range shifts to be more gotcha. southerly? Gotcha. You know what the interesting thing is, is like in Colorado, um, that particular subspecies type four does not seem to be all doesn't seem to move around a whole heck of a lot. So I think mostly the population you'd be seeing in Colorado. Now, we don't know for sure whether some type ones linger after they erupt throughout the West in areas of overlap with other call types. We're pretty certain that. In areas that they touch in Wyoming, the two different populations, they do overlap, but we don't have confirmation of breeding in Colorado of type one. So I'm pretty sure that those numbers in Colorado would be largely reflected by that somewhat resident population of, of uh, that particular call type. Now, budworm, had, you know, there has been some pretty significant cyclical, uh, you know, outbreaks of budworm in the montane west as well so you know it might be cycling with that it might be cycling with some other you know aspen tortrix is another one that's like like uh you know budworm there could be a lot of different dynamics going on why you're maybe seeing uh new populations i wonder i i i just have a question back to the one that, that asked this question, are those numbers you're seeing, and maybe I missed it when you first said the question, are you seeing higher numbers in the summer or winter? Bre breeding time or winter time? I'm just gonna unmute myself. Um, this, this is just based on eBird trends. Uh, gotcha. Yeah, I was just wondering if like the more northerly populations are moving south for some reason. We We don't believe that would be the case, but you know, we need, you know, that's why, a lot of people don't realize, you know, there's a call type dynamic going on here. What you know, and that doesn't exist with all the finches, but it's similar in some ways to red crossbill. They're not nearly as nomadic, but record, record, record. We get a better idea. We fill in gaps of you know what population is where at what time of the year. So I don't think though that it, it would have to do with northern populations. Yeah, Angela Haas had a link there too. Um, the, or mentioning of the Bonter et al. 2008 paper. Um, so that's, yeah, that's a good one to look at, showing that there were declines in the breeding areas in the north, as well as in the south, um, all in winter counts, counts. And, you know, that's for our Pennsylvania data. Yeah, 
um, we can see that too. But um, yeah, Quinn, you want to pull up the next one? There's a lot. There's a lot of uh, questions piling in there. So I'll let yeah, you it's an active that. chat. That's great. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> yeah. So the next question is from Ted, who asked a question also related to forestry. That often there is a heavy reliance on pesticides and herbicides, including budworm control. What do you think the role of pesticides might be in the long-term decline of this species? Yeah, I think we we mentioned this, you know, that too little or too much management could, you know, either lead to the destruction of habitat because the budworms is essentially destroying all the 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 spruce and, and fir trees. Um, but yet if there's a great abundance like some of these outbreaks we're seeing right now in Quebec, then that can bolster the population numbers for evening gross beefs. Um, so so certainly the management is going to be a factor. We're just not sure what's, you know, how big of a factor it is right now. Um, we also know that, you know, we have some foresters um, on our working group and they've said, you know, we, we really can't, like, there's no way to contain the outbreak. They're just kind of treating it um, at like a certain percentage level each year and monitoring where it goes and, and trying to, you know, address it piece by piece. So it's kind of going to continue happening and maybe spread, um, you know, as we, you know, see that dynamic happen with some of the other, um, like a similar species, the, uh, uh, the, what am I blanking? I'm blanking. You're on talking it. about the budworms? The budworms, but it's, yeah, but the, um, oh, the one that's out in Red Lake, <laughs> um, Ontario, the, uh, uh, jack pine, jack, jack pine. pine. Yeah, there's yeah, a jack yeah, pine yeah. bloodworm as well. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah. Um, so yeah, I think that's something we really want to better understand. So, if there are foresters out there or anyone working in forestry who is involved in that treatment, uh, come to our working group. Contact us. That's we, we definitely want to look at that data or the, those sorts of management practices as we look at the data um, of where the growth speaks are going and you know high resolution data of where they're spending their time. And we, we have a budworm specialist in our, on our mm -hmm. group now, Neil yeah. Thompson. Yeah. I believe that's his name. Yeah, he did a lot yeah. of work in British Columbia, which would have been largely type one. Um, but he's now in Maine and he, you know, he gives us a lot of interesting insight. You know, he, you know, David mentioned in that, in that kind of video, he showed the bird going back and forth uh, right in middle of May over about a 14 day period, we reached out to him yesterday and I said, you know, we asked him the question, you know, when do you, when do, when are budworm available for, for gross beaks to start feeding on? And he said about mid-May. So we were like, ah, I wonder if this bird was doing, it's odd to us that the bird went up and then came back and then went back up. You almost wonder if it was doing like a, a sentinel uh, surveyor of the area where it was hoping to go to to see if the budworm were ready yet. And it said, ah, it's not ready yet. We're going to go back for another week and then head back up again. So it's, it's plausible. But yeah, it's, I think one, I was just going to add to that one point is that the, the, at that early May time period, the budworms might still be actually in the bud and not outside the bud. So harder for the gross beaks to get out. And so then, like Matt said, we think champ may have shot up to where he might have wanted to breed, saw that the, Budworms were still in the bud. Go back down to where he maybe he was still getting feeder food. I, it's hard to say. Um, and then bounce back up. Pretty interesting movement. Yeah, so. It's fascinating. What's next, Quinn? Yeah, or, Carol think, asked if you have seen any effects of the summer's fires on movement. We did not actually, and we were looking at that. Um, yeah, our birds were not in the fire areas, <laughs> so um, that was good. Yeah. I guess you know. <laughs> Um, yeah, Tyler Orr, who's the Finch, you know, Finch forecaster, he goes up and does this, you know, assessment in the summertime because that's when, you know, these food crops are developing. And he was like, you know, the gross peaks just aren't in that band where those fires were. In fact, we got lots of questions on how much it might, you know, trigger a large scale, you know, eruptive event this year for all the finches. And we, concluded that we didn't think actually it was going to affect them much this year. And there hasn't been much of an eruption in the East this year for evening gross peak, but there has been a big one out West. Type one is widely ranging this year. And there was, I got a, a, a rec, I got an eBird checklist the other day in Utah 
um, from a gentleman that actually literally had like two different flocks that were largely segregated um, of type ones and type fours in Utah at the feeder in the same day. So we would love to, you know, get more funding to go out West and do an even more extensive survey and tagging event. So any other? Yeah, yeah Just, that, that segues really nicely into John's question who asked, why are some populations eruptive? What's the cause and why are some populations not? That's a million. That's a million dollar question. <laughs> we're we're going to, you know, we're going to look at everything on this. You know, some of the students have interest in looking at the genetics in these. It's interesting. Yeah, the Sierra Nevada bird seems to be resident. There's almost hardly any movement documented with that bird. Uh, the type four in the Rockies doesn't seem to move a whole heck of a lot. But the northern populations do move. You know, I mean, type one is kind of the center of its abundance is. Pacific Northwest, Washington, Oregon, and British Columbia, I would say. And then our, you know, our bird here in the east that's highly eruptive, you know, and there's just all kinds of interest that sparks when we have these big eruptions in the east and they're all of a sudden in people's backyards. And, you know, I haven't seen this bird for 20 years. And, it, you know, in 2020, when we had the super flight, they were in, in Florida as well. So it, it's interesting. I'm not, you know, I, I'm not really sure. And there might be something dietary involved. We do know that some of the like type four in the Rockies and the bird in Mexico seems to prefer conifer seed for us. Uh, you know, we think it is feeding maybe on conifer seed more. Um, so it's, you know, I don't know if that plays a piece of why some are more, you know, resident and some are more uh, eruptive. It's, you know, we need to do more work fascinating this bird's got a lot of a lot of ins and outs to it you know and a lot of challenges too because you don't you can't predict where it's going to be every year you know 100 percent at least yeah What's larry there? larry asked um how much of the disappearance of gross peaks in the winter in the northeast at feeders uh until last year do you think is due to the spruce budworm cycles you want me to take that, David, or you want me? You I want... mean, I mean, I was going to give a simple answer to it, but yeah, yeah. I mean, I think I think that we can see a little bit of a, a, a positive pulse from the outbreaks. You know, there's the major outbreak in Quebec, and we have seen in Pennsylvania. You know, Pennsylvania is kind of the southern extent of what we would consider the regular winter range for for even gross peak in the east, and uh, I think that we've definitely gotten that that kind of population built back up a little bit because of that outbreak and the same way with other places in the Northeast. It so worked. what happens when the outbreak ends and, you know, other factors, fact, you know, come into play like collisions and disease. Um, we don't know, but yeah, it could be a little bit of a boost there. We, we definitely think that. We're, that, that outbreak has been going on for about 10 years now. Yeah. So it's, there's a lot of States in 2020, 2021 there that had their first evening gross peaks and, 30 years, 40 years. Um, so I do think there's certainly a boost there going on, but I don't, we don't believe that's entirely the picture here of what's caused all the declines. I you just know, added a graph, you know, I just added a graph to the chat showing the evening gross peaks on the Saranac Lake, New York Christmas bird count between 1947 and 2014. And you can see a pretty interesting correlation with the uh, spruce budworms. Yeah. It's great to see you, by the way, Larry. <laughs> and likewise yeah no it's interesting i mean i know you've tracked this and you and i have talked about this and you've also done a similar you know kind of graph for purple finch as well over time so it's and, which is you know another boreal bird that's somewhat in concern but not at, at the same level here and just so, uh larry you kind of prompted me there to to say this that the kosawick report actually has some some canada uh, you know based numbers for for those abundance correlations with spruce budworms. So, um, you know, both from winter and, and breeding. So um, there's there's other data there, um, but, you know, a 90% loss is a little bit, is that all budworm? We, we don't know, so. Right, yeah. Yeah, that's, that touches um, on the next question, which asked if the numbers from the 1970s when the spruce budworm outbreaks were massive are a good benchmark or indication of the true population size of the species, or were populations artificially high back then? Maybe the current numbers are more typical for the natural range of variation. 
Another million dollar question. Um, yeah, I mean, what is artificially high? I mean, it's like, you know, the question, and I'm not, I'm just, I'm not nitpicking the question. I'm just saying like that, you know, Matt and I and our whole team talks about that. Um, you know, this whole idea of the the box elder highway, right? The Manitoba Maple Highway is development moved, um, you know, west and the plantings of that allowed the gross peak to move east. Um but, but still, if you look before 1970, and I'm looking at our Pennsylvania winter data, there was still, you know, <laughs> a thousand birds, you know, captured at powder mill. So that's, that still isn't up to that, to that level um, of the 70s. And going from that to like single digits is, is something. I mean, this bird didn't really do, I mean, it was, you know, you go back into the history and I'm working on this right now for the book, but Lillian, you know, it was largely unknown in the East until about the 1850s were some of the first records. 1880s is where it started to pick up some steam. And then by 1930, 40 is when a lot of the states, the Northeastern states and the Eastern provinces documented their first confirmed breeding event. So like you said, like David said, you know, what is, you know, how far are you going to go back in time and where are you going to take that snapshot? You know, clearly there's a lot of dynamics going on here. And there's a lot of, you know, again, getting back to what I was talking about earlier is, you know, there's such interest in this bird. You know, it's almost like if we see them in our backyards, all right, we know we're birds in the boreal or in the montane forests are probably doing pretty good right now. But, you know, if if they all of a sudden drop off and we aren't don't have a finger on the pulse, you know, you could lose something pretty quickly. Um, and it just doesn't, cut, you know, when does it hit a point of no return? 92% decline is pretty drastic. So. There's a couple, this is uh, Paul, uh, there's a couple more uh, questions in the chat and, and we'll get to those. Uh, we are at the top of the hour. I hope people will stay on and, uh, and participate, continue to participate because we do have the ability to extend this beyond the hour. Uh, I want to thank those who have to drop off for attending and participating. Our next one is in uh, January, January 12th specifically. So register for it um, for for your um, for your attendance. Uh, and as has been mentioned a couple of times now, go to our website uh, r2rbirds.org uh, for more information on the webinar series. Our upcoming workshop in January, which will be at the National Conservation and Training Center with Fish and Wildlife Service. So. Uh, lots of good information on that website. So thank you for uh, attending. And I'll let uh, Quinn uh, uh, post up the next uh, question. Yeah, thanks, Paul. Um, so there's a question from Ron asking if there are any data on defining what a viable population uh, number of birds is for evening gross beak. In particular, the U.S. Forest Service analyzes effects to a species and identifies if proposed action would have an effect on their viability at the planning level. It would be great to know what a viable population at the forest level is for analysis purposes. Yeah, I, there, I, there I, are no, yeah. So so there are numbers for Canada in the um, the the Canadian management plan. Um, I don't have that at the top of my brain right now, but I'll look for that uh, if Matt has anything to add. But there's nothing uh, for the United States kind of base population and. It's about what is it like 60 40 or or it's it's almost like half and half between Canada and the US in terms of breeders whenever you look at the western US population versus the the whole boreal breeding population I'll I'll look for those numbers if if Matt wants to go ahead and chime in here Yeah I'll just add that you know when you look at these trends maps that are you know the lab is coming out and other organizations are coming out I mean some of the last ones that are added are these eruptive uh, migrants because they're so tricky to kind of get a good handle on, you know, what is, you know, the population. And, you know, this is largely, you know, a lot of these birds are often in either mountaintops or in largely roadless areas. So, you know, it's, it's just, you know, there's no, I mean, to answer the question, I don't think we really have a good idea of what is a healthy population. Um, but I do think it gives us just that much more reason to 
um, look at these birds long term to get a better handle on them because there's a lot of unknown still on what exactly is a healthy population and you know how much management from a forest perspective and in, in thinning and logging and even budworm application all that stuff is it's a dynamic situation with this bird I mean a lot of these species are dynamic but I do think there's a lot of conservation and educational opportunities that this bird kind of lends itself uh, to. And uh, yeah, we just need to study more, more education, more interest. And let's try to get a handle on what is a viable population. I, don't, I know the Forest Service does not necessarily have those numbers. And again, it has to do with that eruptive migration quality of the, this particular bird. All the finches, I mean, there's the the numbers are relatively poor. Um, any other questions? Yeah, that segues pretty nicely into Pete's question, asking what vital rate data are available for the evening gross week? Do we know anything about breeding, non-breeding, or annual survival? Um, any studies on reproductive success? Not really. There's not yeah. a lot. Yeah, there's not a lot. Um, the again, the best, most comprehensive, you know, review of that type of information is the the Costa Wick uh, status assessment. Um, and I'm gonna I'm gonna look. I'm gonna get the link for that uh, and drop it in there just for folks to go ahead and look at that. Um, but just... again, sorry, go ahead. No, I was just gonna say there there was a, a small study in the Intermountain West. Yeah. that tried to look at breeding. I mean, surprisingly for a gregarious species that graces our backyards in big numbers some years, they're a pretty secretive breeder, actually. Uh, they're not hard, they're not easy to find. I and mean, in any of the historical breeding surveys, you know, comment on how tricky they are to actually find and get a handle on. So, I mean, we had, we had a student at UC Davis, uh, Khan Shao Duman, uh, that was looking at, um, big numbers of them and pretty big numbers of them in Jackson Hole for a few months this summer. And, uh, you know, he did all he could do just to find a couple nests, like in, in a, and some proof of, you know, feeding young. And that's, you know, we are actually, he was able to confirm for the first time ever um, the type one and type four actually overlapped in the breeding season. So, I mean, there's so much that we just don't know about yet. Um, but we would like to get a handle on that, Pete. <laughs> we certainly would like to do some breeding uh, surveys. I think Maine offers some interesting opportunities uh, for that. But Canada and the Mountain West certainly would. You know, and we have some contacts in Oregon that, uh, you know, has them year round, has birds year round, it seems, that we would love to go out and do some additional work. I mean, but Ty, Ty, I was just going to add to that, Matt, Tyler Orr, who um is our is the winter finch forecaster he spends a lot of time in the summer in the boreal where these birds are ostensibly abundant and he says they're just you don't see them they're 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 so secretive when they're breeding um and that's the reason that we've taken this approach for for tagging by focusing where they're easier to catch and congregating at feeders also makes me wonder back to you know some of the historical um things that matt was mentioning and you know the first breeding confirmation is not coming until the 20s or the 40s. Were they breeding before then? And that's just when they were finally noticed, you know, because they're so mysterious. Um, but, you know, I don't think we're, we're not anywhere close to, to doing an integrated population model or, or anything like that. That's if, if we ever will be able to for this species. But just some other thoughts on that. And I dropped in the chat the um, the the management plan uh, for for the. Uh, Canadian population of evening growth speak. And I'm going to try to put in there what their measures of, of um, success are. They're kind of on different time scales, short term and near term. But if we have other questions, we can keep rolling. Yeah, we can talk growth speaks <laughs> all day. Yeah. <laughs> I, <laughs> if you... I just have to run at about three o'clock. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I was confused because it's three o'clock my time, but <laughs> um, if you were to start to capture the stakeholder groups, it seems like forest companies would be one of them, as would bird feeding companies and people who enjoy feeding birds and evening gross beaks. Perhaps engaging these groups at this stage would be fruitful, perhaps also for fundraising. 
Agreed. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Agreed. Yeah. <laughs> I agreed. I mean, we're like, you know, we're <laughs> trying. And if, if you have contacts, send them to us, we'll reach out to them. Um, you know, we have, we have some foresters involved, but I think, I think another starting point for that is, is kind of looking where we're working on the ground now with, with some of the connectivity work and, um, engaging those communities like, like at Saxon Bog, uh, it was not just birders, but there were, you know, there was a township supervisor and, and other, um, business owners, you know, that, that are involved in the community there and what the growth speak and maybe the the broader boreal forest community means to them. Um, yeah, we're looking to get those folks involved. That's what co-production is, is about, getting them involved early. I mean, we're not making any recommendations yet for, for actions and we, we still have to keep, you know, we're at that phase one of the R2R process where we're assessing and learning. And we can certainly learn from, from those folks that are on the ground, foresters, for, forest um, forestry agencies also, um, timber companies if they were interested in getting involved um yeah so we're always looking for more contacts yeah we you know we have some we have a forester in new hampshire and another one neil is very mm -hmm. uh involved in the forestry or at least you know collaborates with foresters in maine you know it would be fabulous to do dream come true you know we get enough of these birds banded in the in the you know in the lower part of their breeding range and then we start to go all right where is there a cluster of these or where is you know can we go up north in in the breeding season and really try to dial in some uh you know where these birds are breeding and what is the micro habitat of you know what they're where they're breeding and what they're feeding on and you know we believe from tyler's reports you know that the one bird in that we banded the first year in minnesota went to uh i don't know was that the one that went to manitoba or was that the one that went to western ontario that he believes ontario. it settled in a what was that it was manitoba. ontario the, the jack was pine a, the jack pine budworm outbreak yeah yeah we believe it settled in a jack pine budworm outbreak area but also clustered around a little hamlet or yeah. a, a business enterprise that had a village of feeders mm -hmm. so it would be great to then start you know, at some point go up there and start to look at, you know, what's going on as, you know, where are they breeding? How does it differ across the range, across the subspecies and call types, etc. But yeah, if you have any, anybody has any contacts, the foresters or forest managers, you know, we've reached out to a lot of people, but that, it, that never ends. That's just an ongoing thing. We're, we're all just almost two years. We're about two years into this project. Yeah, for as for as early as we are in the process, we've got a lot going on, and we're we're trying to you know keep it rolling. Yeah, a lot of student involvement would be great. Maybe there's a student that we can engage that could do some of that breeding ground stuff too. But again, it's interesting to hear Tyler report. You know, he his bird his favorite species is evening grosbeak, and well, I think it's one of the main reasons why you know uh, he's you know the finch forecaster now and he's looking for nests he does he actually does nest surveys across the boreal for a wide range of species and he says man they're hard to come by like to find an actual nest is super hard to come by great we'll go to adrian uh, who has your hand your hand raised <laughs> i moved my uh screen so i lost where my unmute button was. <laughs> um Hi guys, thanks so much for that um, presentation and update. That was really good. I just wanted to throw out there, um, yeah, I was looking at some of the bird atlas data um, for evening gross beaks, and there are very few of our records give any indication of an actual nest. Most of them are fledgling birds, but hopefully Maine still might hold some opportunity for some breeding work. Um, but definitely as far as winter goes, I was just going to throw a pitch um, if you both could uh, get in touch or stay in contact with me. I would love to work with the group, especially given um, in light of CHAMPS data, as well as yep. some of the other winter bird data that you have for Maine. It'd be great to identify some really strong conservation action priorities as Maine goes into our swap plan um, for 2025. And I don't like, yeah, it's great. It's one thing to get them on paper. 
Um, you know, I, do, I don't think our 2015 plan really identified any priority conservation actions specific to Evening Grow Speak. So that's one thing with your recent research that would be great to um, help inform, but it would be great to um, work with Neil, especially kind of speaking to Pete's comments in the chat about engaging timber industry stakeholders and um, bird feeding and just the general public. Yeah. It would be great to, you know, work towards going beyond just getting them on paper in the report and actually, um, you know, having your team between you and Neil and I see Derek Lovich on that we could kind of start yep. to coordinate some actual on the ground conservation actions happening. So let's stay yeah. in touch. Absolutely. Yeah, no, absolutely. Um, I mean, Bill Sheehan also is somebody, that's where we, you know, ended up, we have the feeder cam set up where, where Champ was actually tagged. Yeah, so. Is that Bill's house? It's yep. Bill's house. Yeah. Okay. It's Bill. You can go to the Finch Research Network YouTube channel, and that's the feeder cam at Bill's house where Champ was tagged, and he's only he's been as close as eight miles away in the last week or two here, which yeah, Bill would really love to see. <laughs> yes. So yeah, we'll definitely stay in touch, Adrian. And you know, I yeah. I'm I actually you know. Working for the a natural heritage program, I'm really excited to hear you ask that because I think these action plans are where a lot of on the ground work can can get generated in the states for sure. And um, you know we're working on updating the plan here in Pennsylvania. The, the game com Pennsylvania Game Commission, uh, Fish and Boat Commission are in charge of that, and uh, we, we did we're reviewing evening grow speak. You know as a as a wintering species with you know if it's lost 90 percent of a winter population in Pennsylvania, then there's something we can do, even if it's a campaign for backyard, you know, bird bird feeding stations to, you know, keep them clean, mitigate window collisions, minimize cats, you know, those sorts yeah, of things yeah, are exactly. really important, really important. So we, we want to That's work. the kind of, yeah. The yeah. kind of opportunities that this bird really gives us is tremendous, you know, kind of, you know, birder community, backyard birder community interface. Um, we do also have, um, uh, connection with Birds Canada, and there's an ARU project, so we're excited about to look at some of that information as well on some of the how these populations might mix. Because we're not 100% sure what exactly is going on in that boundary in Alberta and British Columbia. Um, so, yeah. yeah. I regrettably had to decline Luke emailed last week or a couple weeks ago about Maine sponsoring a CSWAG request for the right. evening yeah. grow speak work. And I'm just beyond capacity to take on that kind of administrative um, oversight right now. But if it's, if I can integrate work into my swap demands, then that's kind of where I see like, oh, well, well that's already on my desk right now so i don't have that doesn't you know working with you guys to identify those conservation actions doesn't add too much so hopefully yeah yeah no no worries adrian no yeah that was something that uh, luke and i started kicking around and um we'll just have to see where that goes i mean we're yeah. obviously continuing to look for funding to to keep these this project oh, overarching project going and keep feeding into these student projects and like we've said several times, we need to get out west and we need to continue to fill out these eastern populations because the technology is great, but it also has, you know, there's learning curves with it. And, um, you know, we're, we're getting high quality data, but we have to keep, you know, increasing that sample size. Um, but yeah, just, uh, yeah, totally understand that. And um, just let us know what you need whenever you comes to your, your swap updates. So, yeah, let's stay in touch. And I'm glad Maine birds could get you guys off the ground. This is great data. So I won't occupy any more of the time. Thank you. <laughs> awesome yeah. to see you, Jane. It's great to see everybody. We still have, you know, 40 people here and we're what an hour and 20 minutes in here almost. But any other questions? We we can continue. Yeah, there's still more. Uh Keep going. <laughs> Jennifer was wondering if you have an idea of the extent of domestic cat predation um, and how the, that factors into the declines. We know that that kind of briefly came up in the presentation. 
Uh, not specific data to grow speaks. I mean, there's there's the papers that you know we all know about, but um, yeah, no, I I think that's that's something that obviously needs to be addressed in the larger bird conservation picture, um, but might be a specific uh, thing that is impacting grow speaks. And I I know um, Sue Wilson from St. Lawrence University in New York has. Um, has done some work on that. So, so she's kind of integrating what she has done. Um, and I know add to that, Matt? Yeah, I know Stephanie too. I don't know if Stephanie's yeah. still on here, but yeah. uh, she yeah. has a lot of interest in this. And I know Pete's had interest in this. I mean, and again, this is another one of those species, you know, this spe species really kind of brings that dynamic uh, at play uh, with, you know, cats and education. And, you know, we, don't have any real data on that as far as I know um, on, you know, mortality from cats, but, you know, it's clearly exists. I mean, uh, you know, you got a, a flock, you know, a species that's gregarious that flocks in the hundreds and backyards where a lot of people have, you know, pet cats and they're not indoors. So, I mean, this is a larger, again, as David said, a larger kind of topic that is very tricky to handle. Um, but is something that, you know, I think we need to continue to try to keep moving, you know, the needle in the right direction. And this species also offers that opportunity for a lot of education around these kind of issues, these, you know, collisions and disease and cats. And I mean, more than any, in my, in my opinion. And, and I think just to build on that, Matt, it is it's interesting as we know, you know, Cats are the number one direct mortality that we that we know about in the U.S. and Canada, and and their effect on bird populations is is huge. Often we're thinking about resident backyard birds, right? But here we have uh, a migrant species that comes to your feeders for sometimes seven months out of the year. They can be in Pennsylvania for seven months out of the year. That's longer than they are on the breeding grounds, and who knows, you know, how many months in between depending on, you know, different food supplies and, and what have you. Um, so yeah, it's, it's, a, it's adding, it's, it's, it's taking a species that, you know, is on these conservation lists that's in your backyard that, that is potentially probably having the same impacts to it that your cardinals or your chickadees or your sparrow, you know, song sparrows might ha have happening that other people aren't talking about as much. So in a way this, not just an umbrella species of boreal forest conservation, but also for, for just backyard bird conservation. Yeah, backyard bird health. That's why I mentioned, you know, wellness for, for finches, wellness for you kind of, <laughs> you know, with, uh, you know, Grosbeak being a poster child for that. I think there is, you know, potentially something there that you can move the needle on because, you know, this bird kind of encapsulates a lot of these human, you know, interest, conservation education points that come in contact with one another. Great, and I think that brings us to our the, the rest of our questions. Um, I think we're all caught up and we've had a really lively, great discussion. So thank you so much for your presentation, for all these really engaging questions that we had in the chat as well. Thank you, Quinn, and a, a big thanks to you, David and Matt, for, uh, for a great presentation and and, and all the work you do that led up to doing this. And, and thanks for being such a, a great partner with uh, Road to Recovery and working through this. So uh, our hats off to you and, and thanks. And a reminder to everybody um, that our next webinar series will be Friday, January the 12th. We'll have another spotlight on a species working group and a species that uh, uh, will need uh, our conservation work as well. Um, also, a, a reminder, if uh, you are still interested, we might have a handful of, of spots still left at our, at our January workshop, but we are very, very near capacity, and uh, we're very heartened by the, the uh, attendance there. Uh, again, we'll put the recording up on the website in the next couple of days, and so that you all will be able to revisit this as you want. And um, we appreciate your attendance and your support for Road to Recovery. Thanks again, everybody. Have a great day, a great weekend. Thank, Thank you. you. Take care. Take care, everybody. And Paul, before.